Hi there, and welcome back uh, for this lecture on hypertension. As I promised you, I'd have the lecture for farm pharmacology uh, regarding hypertension you will have after you get back from the break, um, either on campus if we're back uh, or again online, and I'll upload that, that lecture at some point. Haven't even made it yet. So let's, uh, without further ado, hopefully, hopefully you guys are enjoying your spring break and uh, being safe with the coronavirus and uh, your families as well. So let's jump right in to the, uh, the lecture here. And before we go into any small details of any type regarding blood pressure and, uh, um, and medications and treatments and nursing interventions and whatnot, let's try to understand what blood pressure is. And if you just break down the word blood and pressure, it means that somehow some type of pressure, we're talking physics here, uh, is happening or building up within your blood. And that can be a pretty, pretty big no-no or pretty big dangerous thing, especially for patients who have other comorbidities, diseases like diabetes and, and whatnot. So the risks with, with having high blood pressure are, are pretty high. Um, and so blood pressure really refers to the, the force of the blood, the blood that is going through the vessel is exerting uh, a force up against the arterial wall as the heart pumps the blood. And what you wanna know is that um, it's important to have strong, flexible, healthy arterial walls. Otherwise, uh, that force of blood that is exerting itself up against the arterial wall will cause uh, even further damage. So it's not so much the blood that's going through, but uh, the how the walls of the vessels, uh, the state and the, the state of health at the arterial wall vessels, is specifically the endotheliums, uh, uh, have. That will make a, a huge difference in terms of if blood pressure goes up or down or and, uh, and how we treat blood pressure as well as we'll get to that in our farm lecture. So um, generally speaking, we, we say that a blood pressure has to be at least two or more measurements of both systolic and diastolic. We generally say uh, one reading is not enough. Uh, ideally, you want to have two or more. Three would be ideal, usually same time of the day. And it's important to understand the, the definitions of because systolic and diastolic is is really the the bread and butter of uh, blood pressure and understanding the the physics behind it and eventually understanding the treatments that we're going to be giving especially if you're working in any critical care setting um, so the systolic uh, blood pressure is basically the pressure against that arterial wall as we just said when the heart is contracting so when the when you when you palpate your pulse and you feel the boom, 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 boom. The systolic is that exertion against arterial wall when your heart contracts, exactly at the time of the heartbeat. Diastolic, which is the lower number, is the amount of pressure of that, 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 that pressure that's exerted against the, the arterial wall when the heart relaxes uh, between the heartbeats. That's okay. And so this is, will make a big difference when we get to uh, talking about uh, cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. Um, so uh, some people call it high blood pressure, other people call it hypertension. You'll see me throughout this chart use HTN as hypertension, and it's, it's a major, major risk factor, uh, but it's a disease as well. Um, it, it is, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many professionals and articles that we can that you can find online, PubMed and whatnot, the, that it also is a manifestation of some underlying problem, but it has its own uh, code and, uh, and um, it, it, but so think of hypertension as both uh, risk factors for quite a few things. And if your blood pressure goes up, literally your chances of getting a MI, myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack, stroke, heart failure, AFID goes up, uh, as well, together with, with your blood pressure. Um, and it's also known as the silent killer. A lot of people call myocardial infarction or a heart attack the silent killer, but really the, the problem that we're seeing is that quite a few people uh, have hypertension or high blood pressure and uh, don't know it or are not being treated for it. Uh, and uh, for, for whatever reason, they may not be taking their meds, they may not have gone to see a doctor, they may not have health insurance for many reasons, 
but because of this fact, uh, a lot of the heart attack, strokes, fa heart failure, and, and AFib and other underlying conditions that we're seeing in a lot of our patients uh, is linked to, uh, to high blood pressure as well. Um, and they call we call it a disease because it is something that if you have it, you get a drug for it. So they had to create 401.7, or I forget exactly what the code for it was. Um, but by making it a disease, then we can now treat it with a drug. But we'll, as we'll, we'll go through here, there's uh, quite a few other methods that we would always want to try to do before doing uh, any type of pharmacological intervention um, with patient education. And I'm talking here mostly nursing model as opposed to medical model. And when you think of the word hypertension, it really is a tension. That's why we say high blood pressure. The pressure within your blood, basically really within your arterial walls, um, is, is growing. That pressure is growing. What exactly does that tension mean? What exactly does that pressure mean? Well, what it really means is that your arteries, uh, which should generally be relatively healthy um, and flexible, they start to stretch to a point that is beyond a healthy limit. And that is where the problem starts, right there, right then. If you have an arterial blood vessel that already is overloaded uh, from lifestyle and even from medications that the patient might be on, then there's always already going to be a certain, especially if you have diabetes and other conditions, a certain level of oxidative stress and inflammatory or, uh, chronic inflammation in, in the area in the endothelium cells. And so when you take that blood pressure, that, that, that blood, uh, that, uh, that artery, and, and you stretch the wall of it, really what you're doing is, uh, and, and notice in the box on the right, it says chronic overstretching. So not only do you have chronic inflammation and oxidative stress, but what that ends up leading to is we really need to get the blood through your body. So if you smoke and you have vasoconstricted, it's harder to get through. If you're diabetes and you have thick blood, it's harder for the blood to get through. So the body somehow has to open up the lumen uh, of, your, of your artery to allow um, the blood to get through to do the perfusion to carry this oxygen and nutrients. But if you have a chronic overstretching of the artery, what ends up happening is that blood vessel ends up having tears and scarring and weak spots that will rupture and plaque will build up. That's the and blood clot will form. And all and this increases the workload of the heart, which means the heart has to work harder to get the, the same amount of the blood uh, to the areas that where we want them to get to. And so I'll show you another chart as well as the one below in a different format, but it's important for you to learn this and memorize this. The licensure examination likes to see if you're aware of where, uh, what stage a patient is in. So if we usually go by 120 over 80 as normal, uh, 120 to 129 systolic is pre-hypertension. Once they get to 130 systolic to 139, they're stage one. And once they're above 140, they're stage two. And likewise with the uh, diastolic, the lower number, if they're below 80, they're normal. If they're below 80, they're still relatively normal. Once they get to 80 to 89, they're stage one and above 90 is stage two. Now, mind you, um, this is just something that um, we have to know and learn and memorize, but what you really want to understand as well is when you're in the clinic and you're seeing a patient, you're seeing an old lady uh, who happens to have a baseline of a blood pressure continuously. She's had this for the last 10 years like this. Oh, I always have 91 over 74, right? And that just is her, her baseline, right? She may have underlying conditions, but we don't want to always assume that 120 over 80 is the ideal blood pressure and to assume that somebody who is, tends to be low should be higher or somebody who's high should be low if that is their baseline, especially in the elderly, a big problem that we're seeing in the clinics today is that patients are being over medicated and when you drop their blood pressure too much that perfusion to the brain doesn't happen as well or it happens slower and when the patient goes to stand up the body moves faster than the blood is able to pump to the brain and they get that head rush they get sort of dizzy and then they fall and then they up, end up in the hospital with a broken bone hip fracture because of uh, antihypertensive medication so it's really so again remember each person is going to have relatively speaking their baseline and when you go to call the doctor to notify of a problem always make sure you look at to see what where the baseline of that patient has been and what medications we've been giving them 
that might be contributing to them being where they're at in terms of their vital signs or blood pressure specifically. I always, as you know me, like to throw in uh, uh, extra information for you to be aware of what's going on. And this is just, uh, there's quite a few drug-induced nutrient depletion charts out there. If you just put in drug-induced nutrient depletion PDF, you'll get a whole bunch of them. And this is just a snippet of one that I uh, uh, uploaded for you. It's drug category A. There's quite a few other categories. Anti-seizure medications, anti-hyperlipidemia -li medications, um, NSAIDs, and all of those will have certain nutrients that will be depleted. But since today we're talking about blood pressure, um, this category of antihypertensives, and notice that it, it's, we're, they're not, we're not even giving you the name of the medication like lisinopril or, or, a, or a losartan or metoprolol or something of that nature. We're giving you the, the so ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, or what we call ARBs, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, they will all lead to possible uh, nutrient depletions. Um, and so if you look at that third uh, column right there, one of the things that it depletes is zinc, which we know is important also for the immune system, and potassium, right? And so it's generally not a bad idea to consume some more of that, uh, of those two. But look at the one right next to it. They also say additional suggested nu nutrients for su nutritional support. It is believed also, and I would actually uh, put CoQ10 under a drug-induced nutrient depletion because there's significant new evidence showing that most of these categories of blood uh, antihypertensive blood pressure medications um, do cause CoQ10. And we'll get into this a little bit later on into the future. And so then the last one sort of gives you a little bit of a rundown of what you could be doing uh, in conjunction with your medication. The patients may be on a lot of these, although we do have to watch out with CoQ10, fish oil, garlic, ginkgo, and a few of the others because they put patients at risk for bleeding, um, as you well know, and I've, I've talked to you uh, significantly about. This is just a repeat of what I've said previously. When your as your blood pressure goes up, so does your risk for getting a myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack, a heart failure, stroke, renal disease. Remember, the heart is a muscle, um, and the muscle is built of cells, and those cells can weaken. Uh, and also, apart from it being a muscle, it's an electrical conduction system, and we'll talk a little bit later about that. And we can find out if the heart, in terms of its electrical conduction system, is doing what it should be doing through doing an ECG, electrocardiogram. One out of every three adults in the United States has hypertension, and uh, the Healthy People 2020 and the one that they're getting ready to come out with, actually it should be out, if not already, within the next year, uh, they're starting to work on, on the next uh, Healthy People, but they've always had hypertension as one of the highest uh, priorities for uh, public health concern and for individual uh, providers, primary care providers, hospitals, uh, hospitalists and whatnot to focus on, on, on blood pressure. Again, the risk with this is do we over treat and we have to watch out, especially in the, in the elderly. This is a chart that really looks at obesity and di diabetes, not hypertension. I got it right off the CDC. But so you see, we, we really don't know if, if, if it's the hypertension that's leading to the growth. And look, look at how we've gone from obesity in 94 all the way to 2013, and then the bottom one with the uh, diabetes from 94 all the way to 2013. We're well above 9%. And actually, some people are saying 14, 16, and even significantly more. Um, so in 2013 is quite a few years ago, so there's probably new updated information uh, available. But link diabetes and obesity in your mind with hypertension. We don't know, again, as hypertension leads to a lot of the diabetic problems, but we know that uh, they tend to go hand in hand. And if you're diabetic and don't have high blood pressure, it's probably just a matter of time before you are, especially if you're not uh, treating the underlying diabetes um, and then getting your your uh, and, and and lifestyle and medications to to control it. Otherwise, your blood pressure will really be um, uh, at higher risk. And again, um, that puts you at risk for quite a few other problems. Um, so again, back to that notion. I really want you guys to get. Um, 
it dug it buried planted like a seed into your brain the idea of when we say blood pressure or hypertension keep down those two words pressure and tension pressure and tension and when you always hear that word high, high blood pressure or or hypertension you always want to go back to the arteries it's the artery walls and what part of the artery walls at the molecular level the endothelial cells that really are where uh, they're, they're the crux of the problem of the, of the matter that we're dealing with, which is high blood pressure, which really is putting a lot of people at risk and, and making and, and killing a lot of people, really. And so this is just a repeat of what we said earlier. And I think it's important to keep in mind that blood pressure or hypertension is linked to stretching of the arteries, which is linked to the endothelium, which we know leads to scars and tearing of the endothelium wall of the arterial blood vessel, weak spots that rupture. When there's a rupture, clots have to form, plaque have to build up. And ultimately, one thing that should be in between uh, where it says increased plaque buildup and increased workload of the heart really should be um, the lumen. The lumen of the blood vessel is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And how do we treat that? Well, we should always want to start off with lifestyle as the first thing, but in the hospital, in acute and critical care settings, if somebody comes in and has had a lot of tears and scarring over a long time, weak spots, a rupture, blood clots start to form, plaque builds up, the uh, lumen of the vessel starts to get smaller, we put in a stent into the heart or the vessel that is closed and has a lot of buildup and there are ways through lifestyle that we can absolutely prevent anybody from having to go in and get a stent and it's thought that 83 percent of uh, adults in this case above 20 years old aged above 20 uh, uh, have hyper that have hypertension know they have it uh, 76 percent of them are being treated and 48% uh, do not currently um, have their blood pressure well controlled. So it's, it's, it's uncontrolled hypertension. So that's a pretty significant risk for the population that's out and about for them to get uh, uh, a heart attack or a stroke or uh, whether it be ischemic or hemorrhagic, either way. And this is a really important chart to look at because it'll help you understand how the, the body really functions. When you think about blood pressure, really it's again the force that's exerted, right? By the blood against the blood, the blood vessels, but then the blood vessels also have a, a specific condition. They might already be ruptured, they may already be full of plaque, and they may already be full of clots. Um, but the it basically it's the primarily function of uh, the cardiac output. Um, which is the total blood through um, the, the, the systemic per, per minute, right? So you got to think about cardiac output as per minute, right? Um, and when you think about systemic vascular resistance, it's the force that is uh, opposing the heart, which is prohibiting the heart from pumping the blood forward to do the perfusion as it should be doing, right? So resistance is... Uh, an important thing to keep in mind because we can give drugs to increase cardiac output. We can give drugs to decrease vascular resistance. For example, vasodilators like nitroglycerin is one that can open up the blood vessel, which is basically opening up the lumen of the, of the blood vessel to allow uh, that blood to to go through. And remember that as the arteries dilate, the resistance to to blood flow decrease. Remember that, right? So if the arteries dilate, which is what nitroglycerin will do, the resistance to the blood flow decreases. So really we'll talk about in the hypertension uh, pharmacological lecture that I will have when you get back from spring break, we'll go into the, the two main functions of how we can treat blood pressure. And I will go over it in this lecture here uh, as well, just very briefly. So, so there are a lot of factors that influence blood pressure. I always say we got to think about lifestyle, what we're doing, what we're putting in our mouth clearly, right? But when you start moving into nursing within acute or critical care set settings, it's, it's uh, imperative that you understand that blood pressure is really the relationship between the heart's ability to pump the blood out per minute, which is the cardiac output, and that resistance that downstream from the heart they're going to, the heart is going to find 
And so it's important to know this, especially for pharmacology, for treatments because the cardiac output is really looking at, and when you think cardiac, we have to think the heart rate, contractility, and conductivity. And conductivity goes to the electrical conductivity. Um, and you'll, you will, we'll talk about that briefly later on. But cardiac output also has a lot to do with um, the renal angiotensin system uh, and whether or not the kidneys are being perfused uh, with a proper amount of blood or if there is a lack of perfusion. And so we'll go over that um, in a few slides down from here in a little bit more detail. So just remember, the cardiac output is related to the heart and the kidneys, and your vascular resistance is very much related to the uh, autonomic nervous system, especially how the sympathetic will uh, be activated and uh, affect and raise, in fact, uh, the blood pressure. Another important aspect that affects vascular resistance is neurological and hormonal or neurohormonal. And that's when we get into angiotensin and norepinephrine and epinephrine, um, as we'll, we'll cover later on. And then also there are local ray regulators um, that can either vasoconstrict and ET or endothelin is a very potent vasoconstrictor and nitric oxide is one that is a, is a pretty pretty strong uh, vaso, vasodilator. Um, so uh, continuing uh, to look at the factors of why your patient may have blood pressure, um, you really want to try to understand the nervous system, which as soon as the blood pressure drops, really reacts within seconds to a, a drop in your blood pressure, it will increase your blood pressure primarily by activating the sympathetic nervous system. Does that make sense, right? So sometimes when you draw a significant amount of blood from a patient from their central venous catheter, uh, if you draw a significant amount of blood, you're removing uh, volume from the central venous catheter. You may want to replace some of that fluid back in so that the body will not sense that there's a drop in volume because if they sense the blood pressure drops, it's going to automatically go up. So we could be causing that by many things um, that we'll go into later. But just re remember that if there's a drop in the blood pressure, the body will react by activating the sympathetic nervous system to help the body uh, balance out and increase that blood pressure. Also increase symp sympathetic system uh, really is going to increase two other things, your heart rate and your contractility, right? And that can lead to a, a vast problem of vasoconstriction in, in your, your, your periphery, which ultimately once that, remember, and this is where the kidneys, this is where that uh, kidney renal function kicks in. When your peripheral arterioles are vasoconstricted, right, because of the heart rate increase and contractility increase, um, they're going, that's going to promote the release of renin from the kidneys because it's the kidneys that are going to release that renin. And we'll talk about that again a little bit later. Um, so keep all of that in mind. Basal baroreceptors sorry, are, are really nerve cells that are in the carotid arteries and I think in the aorta as well. And they play a big role in blood pressure st stability and stabilizing it. They're the ones that, uh, th so this is why when you hear the word blood pressure or hypertension, we need to think about what? The walls, the arterial walls, and specifically where? The endothelium cells. And it's the, at the cellular level, there are these baroreceptors, nerves, nerve cells, that are what, they're, they're, that are what detect within the body that stretching is happening. And so imagine if you're chronically overstretched, your, your blood ar ar arteries are overstretched, then your baroreceptors are going to constantly be stimulated uh, by the increase in blood pressure. And that's going to send more impulse around, creating sympathetic reaction, and it's just a, it's a vicious cycle. So for a pharmacological perspective, uh, per aspect, it's important to remember that inhibition of the sympathetic system will uh, help in to decrease the heart rate and the force of contraction or contractility 
and vasodilation in the periphery. Um, so it's, it's really important, right? Which, uh, let's think about this one more time. When there's a fall in blood pressure, the baroreceptors are going to sense it. What's going to be activated? Sympathetic nervous system, right? That's really important to understand. Um, again, we've been talking about this uh, over the last few slides. The endothelium really ultimately through the neurohormonal and uh, quite a few other factors regulate whether things vasodilate and vasoconstrict, right? And remember, I always like to use the yin and the yang as an example. So what happens when you smoke a cigarette? What is the main toxin that's going into your body? We know it's nicotine. Nicotine is a vasoconstrictor. It takes your blood vessels and it tightens them. So if your heart is already working overtime and it's enlarged or you're having tachycardia or palpitations, a vasoconstrictor would probably be the last thing you would want to give, like smoking or nicotine, because you would be doing what? Increasing the resistance against which the heart has to beat. And so what's the other thing that we do probably for most of these patients, especially the patient who comes in saying chest pain, chest pain, 10 out of 10, I feel an elephant on my chest and my left arm is hurting, although in women it's quite different. So we have to be careful. It's a lot more riskier for the females to get the heart problems or heart attacks because their manifestations are quite different. In the man, it's very, it tends to be very typical. But the medication that we want to give to that chest pain patient is a vasodilating uh, drug and we all know that uh, we can give it sublingually or we can give it through a, a, a paste or a gel on the chest it's nitroglycerin and that's the other aspect it dilates your blood vessels which helps your heart rest and that's why we tell the patients in at home if you're taking nitroglycerin take up to three no more than three wait about five minutes in between uh, if at the third one that chest pressure will first of all we tell them sit down all right sit down don't do any more activity because getting up and walking and being anxious walking around your kitchen while you have chest pain is counterproductive so we would tell the patient to sit down relax then take your three doses of sublingual nitroglycerin and uh and then we'll uh and then if the third dose doesn't alleviate your chest pain call 911 and get to the hospital um so so from the renal system again the kidneys really play a big role in blood pressure med med uh, regulation and why two things we have to think about water and salt water and salt right so when you hold water back in what do you think the reaction of the water is going to be you're going to retain water and remember uh, as we'll talk about later really in essence uh, pharmacolo pharmacologically speaking for blood pressure there's only really two ways to treat generally speaking blood pressure and one of them is to reduce the volume and we give what what do we do to give volume we make them pee out a lot of fluid we give them diuretics correct and those diuretics help them pee and by peeing they're losing some of that water or extra water that they have retained possibly due to that sodium retention and so here's where that sodium comes in but I have a couple charts and side thoughts on sodium uh, so patients who are going through hypertension problems and especially crisis we really want to watch out with their sodium levels um, and we'll, we'll get into that shortly and so so what happens when you retain that salt it retains water this increases the extracellular volume and what what happens with that what happens is it increases the venous return. Remember the SCDs that we have on the leg? We want to uh, create oh, my cat here. Uh, you, we, you, we put the SCDs on to create the venous return on patients that are in the bed unable to move because we don't want them to get clots. Well, in this case, when you retain salt, which retains water, which increases that extracellular fluid, it's going to increase the venous return back to the heart and the stroke volume as well. And what do those two things do? They're going to increase the cardiac output and your blood pressure. So we have to we have to uh, uh, be careful with. And remember that RAAS or renin angiotensin. Key thing is to remember is the, it's the kidneys that secrete renin in response to what? Sympathetic nervous stimulation. Sympathetic nervous stimulation make the kidneys secrete renin. 
okay? And, um, and, uh, um, and it helps would decrease overall sodium concentration, which is what they're, what they're trying to do. And, uh, and, um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about angiotensin converting enzymes, uh, ACE inhibitors, uh, because it, it, that system, the renin system ultimately will lead to blood pressure increase and we want to lower it. So we work on that RAS system with an ACE inhibitor uh, to um, prevent the conversion from angiotensin one to two. Um, all right, let's go to the next chart. Uh, the endocrine system definitely plays a major role in, uh, in, in blood pressure, mainly because it stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. And we know that the, the, one big part of the nervous system, or we should know, is epinephrine, right, is released. And that causes, again, cardiac output increase, heart rate, myocardial contractility. And if in somebody who is having uh, certain types of shocks and they're, or they're bleeding or their blood pressure is dropping fast, you want to give them an epinephrine because it's going to vasoconstrict and hopefully save their lives. But in people that have high blood pressure, you generally don't want to be giving uh, the, the, the epinephrine. Um, um, and so aldosterone as well is uh it stimulates the kidneys to hold water and salt back again what does that do increases a blood volume and therefore the the cardiac the cardiac output this is the same chart that i showed earlier just try to remember that normal is below 120 systolic blood pressure 120 to 139 is prehypertension you get you get the point and since you get the point Let's give you a question to see if you got the point. The nurse determines that the patient has stage two hypertension. When the patient's average blood pressure is, okay, so the question is asking you stage two, and it's giving you A, B, C, D, and E, five blood pressure readings, both systolic and diastolic. Which of these are stage two? Okay, so let's go back to that previous chart. Let's look at stage two. Hypertension stage two says their systolic has to be 160 or above, or not and, their diastolic has to be above 100. So we can look at the systolics, 150, 155, 172, bingo, C is one, 160, bingo, it's at 160. Yeah, that's an iffy one, but I would still say if it's at 160, it is, and then one, uh, 182, clearly. And then if you look at the diastolic, 96, no, uh, remember, 96 is above 100. 96, no, 88, no, 92, no, uh, uh, 110, 106, definitely. So the answer is going to be C, D, and E are, the, are, both, are all three stage two hypertension. And that's important to remember. The etiology or the cause or where it comes from really is divided, let's keep this simple, into primary and secondary. Primary and secondary. So where does blood pressure come from? Primary, secondary. Secondary tends to be the, the, a significantly smaller percentage. Primary is also con called essential or idiopathic. Uh, we, they, we were trying to get away from that word idiopathic because it really indicates we don't know. So we call it essential hypertension or primary hypertension. And it, 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 I like the word idiopathic because it re reminds me that it's basically a high blood pressure without an identified cause. We don't know where it's, where it's coming from. But, but uh, we'll talk about um, that in another slide that I have down here. I'll, we'll go over that as well. And that's almost 95% of the cases. That's important to keep to keep in mind. Secondary hypertension is an elevated blood pressure with a specific cause. We know what's causing it, and so we can correct it. But this is only five to ten percent. So if you have uh, an underlying renal problem, we'll treat the renal disease, which should help the blood pressure. If you have an underlying uh, thyroid problem, we'll treat we'll treat the thyroid problem, and that should help with your blood pressure. Um, but the, again, these are these are the smaller of, of both cases. This is just a chart to show you um, primary hypertension, essential hypertension is idiopathic. We don't have a slight clue. 
and secondary could be chronic kidney disease, Cushing's, uh, drug-induced or drug-related, right? So I'll, I'll talk about that. That goes back to the CoQ10 and drug-induced nutrient depletions. A lot of the medications that patients are on could reduce nutrients that could end up increasing their blood pressure. So yes, that could actually be a, a cause. And you can see the other causes. But what I'd like to throw into the picture is I think from a scientific perspective, we and, and the, the tremendous amount of literature that's out there, we do know where idiopathic uh, or primary hypertension is coming from to a degree. We've not pinpointed it, but we can take a step back and look at uh, overall micronutrients, for example, nutrients in your blood, the trace elements, for example. You, you, we want to be at the level of optimal tissue right that our tissues have optimal levels of micronutrients but again if you're that classical lady who sits on her porch smokes cigarettes and drinks coffee and eats really no food um, then she's clearly not going to be in that first level of optimal tissue levels of micronutrients right and if you go all the way to the end most of the patients you're going to see in the hospital especially those who have all those amputations necrotic necrosis uh, congestive heart failure, kidney failure, and all of these problems, they're in the clinical disease close to that, between that and death, many of them, right? Not all, but many of them, but they're, they're definitely sick. Well, in between the optimal tissue levels and getting to that clinical disease, there are a few steps that can lead to um, initial depletion, which may or may not be detected. Well, actually, from a primary care perspective, they won't be detected because nobody's checking for micronutrients in patients' uh, blood or, or tissues. Uh, you'd have to go out of pocket and go to a specialized uh, personalized medicine or functional medicine doctor to, to get that read. Um, but once they, the biochemical functions start to be impaired, that's where the level of hypertension starts to happen and the oxidative damage uh, together, the oxidative stress, I should be saying, the free radicals are going around. And remember, we talked about antioxidants, phytonutrients is really important to try to help and work at this level, right? Because if we do it at this level, we can prevent them from getting uh, to functional defects, uh, which is where they start feeling tired and weak. But the doctor may still say, well, you, there's nothing wrong with you. Well, that's the allopathic training, which is trained to treat a symptom. If you don't have a symptom and the labs that we're checking are normal uh, and then you, you still feel weak or tired, it's probably not a bad idea to uh, consider what am I doing in my lifestyle? Am I exposing myself to toxins? Do I work in an environment where there's metals? Because we know that uh, metal buildup in, in, in the blood uh, and, and, and toxins, right? Uh, lead to very, very high amount of blood pressures, uh, high blood pressure, hypertension. And so what am I eating? What type of food am I eating? A lot of uh, junk food diet, uh, uh, sodas with high fructose corn syrup, so on and so forth. And we can target it before we get to that clinical disease state, um, at which point they're probably going to be giving a pharmaceutical and still nobody will have talked to them about the need and the reasons why their underlying or so-called idiopathic uh, primary hypertension is actually happening. Um, resistant hypertension is, and I have a couple slides on this one later on to, to sort of remind us of the importance of this. Um, when you have blood pressure 140 over 90, uh, while on three different classes of uh, medication, including a diuretic, or you're taking four or more antihypertensives medication. Now, there are a significant amount of doctors out of there. One of them, I, I, read, I read her book, Sherry Rogers. She's a medical doctor, used to work in trauma uh, until she went into more uh, upstream medicine to try to look at the underlying conditions. And, and she and quite a few of other people, uh, Alan Gabby and, and, uh, and uh, Jonathan Wright, they, uh, all medical doctors within the allopathic system uh, have, have started to, to believe that if you take one antihypertensive medication, it will deplete certain nutrients and the enzyme CoQ10 will be will drop. And when you have a low CoQ10 enzyme, what's what you'll see is your blood pressure will increase. And so it's normal to go back to your doctor, they'll give you a second drug, and that drug is also going to de deplete certain nutrients like that CoQ10 or CoQ10 enzyme. 
coenzyme 10, Q10. And th then the second medication will deplete more. And you'll see that what ends up happening is medications are on three, four medications, and they end up having to take direct vasodilators dilators, like, you know, maybe uh, hydralazine, or they need to be maybe even on clonidine, uh, because it just, it's just, just not, it's just not, not working. Things aren't working, right? And so uh, I would add to that little list of other causes is that the medications that they're actually on uh, are definitely helping in the acute short-term uh, period, but they're not necessarily helping that patient chronically, which is why lifestyle should be the foundation, the foundation approach, foundational approach for any uh, blood pressure, high blood pressure or, or hypertension. The pathophysiology, uh, we've been talking about it uh, all the way through uh, up until up until now. Basically, what you end up have, having is increased uh, uh, cardiac output with or without the vascular resistance, the systemic vascular resistance. But, you know, in, that increased cardiac output can be found in people who are prehypertensive. Some people go in and they have cardiomegaly, enlarged heart which is a sign, generally speaking, that the body is trying to compensate for some either resistance or some vasoconstriction that's happening in the body, more likely than not because of the lifestyle that they're living. So later on in the hypertension, you'll start to see, together with that uh, increase of uh, CO, which may go, 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 go down or up, it depends, but that vascular resistance is going to um, increase. And, and one of the key classic signs of hypertension is a persistent increase systemic systematic vascular resistance um, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll cover that uh, a little bit later um, risk factors age obviously age can but that doesn't necessarily mean it will people in their 70s or 80s can be healthy if they remain active and, and eat properly uh, but again, mentally, they de-stress, they have, uh, sit out in the sun, they take vitamin D, uh, and so on and so forth. You can, you can really, somebody, somebody in their 30s who has very bad lifestyle could be somebody that could be worse than somebody in their 70s with a good lifestyle. So age is, it is a factor to consider, clearly it always is. Alcohol as well, tobacco use, we talked about it. Um, um, and so moderation with drinking, you know, one or two drinks per day. Uh, if you have hypertension, uh, tobacco, we know a tre tremendous, probably one of the biggest ones is tobacco. Diabetes mellitus is if your blood sugars are thick, high, elevated, it's affecting every organ in your body. You could go blind, you could get an amputation, you better believe it's going to raise your high blood pressure. Elevated serum lipids uh, end up leading to uh, atherosclerosis, and that's a, a big problem, right? Hyperlipidemia is always... Um, uh, uh, treated with a statin, for example, um, but also um, fiber is a really good thing to lower that. And excessive dietary sodium, and I really want to put an emphasis on excess of dietary sodium. I, 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 you, we need to get away from don't eat salt, um, just don't add more salt. And a lot, a lot of the foods that we're eating already have plenty of salt. We don't necessarily have to add salt, but what we want to uh, be careful with, especially the elderly, is to say don't eat any salt. Um, salt plays a major, major role in, in proper health, uh, as we'll, we'll talk about. Whether or not you've had a family history of, uh, of hypertension is a risk factor. If you're obese, uh, weight gain, right, is the, basically the abdominal obesity, where adipose tissue is the type of fat that we're uh, looking at as the bad fat. So remember, fats with an S at the end, that's a food. Fats are good. Um, fat in the abdo abdomen, the tissue, the adipose tissue, so-called fat, is bad fat. So when they say is fat good or bad, we need to say, are we talking about the dietary fats or are we talking about the adipose tissue fat? And it's the adipose tissue fat or obesity that puts the patient at significant higher risk for hypertension. Ethnicity, uh, and, and uh, two times higher in African-Americans than, than in whites. Um, we don't know if that's genetic or lifestyle, um, but lifestyle is going to affect everybody across the board, um, re regardless of, um, of ethnicity. Um, and then sedentary lifestyle or lack of exercise um, will increase your cardiovascular risk again, stroke, heart attack, uh, ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke, 
right? And physical activity can drop your blood pressure. Yeah, socioeconomic status, if you're less educated or you live in areas where you have more uh, uh, stores to buy alcohol and tobacco than, than for stores to buy a fruit or a farmer's market, then we know that it's, it's clear that more people have uh, uh, chronic diseases like the metabolic syndrome X um, and hypertension. And then stress really is just a major, major uh, factor. In fact, when we think of blood pressure and hyper tension and we think of the arter arterial walls with that endothelial uh, stress on every level whether you're doing the physical stress and you're going out to do crossfit and you're overworking your heart uh, overworking your body that's a form of stress so i think some literature is starting to say that exercise is absolutely good for you especially outdoors walking ambulating running but it's in moderation <coughs> excuse me um uh, but then there's the stress that happens uh, on the mental level, spiritual level, soul level, call it what you want, uh, um, can also lead to uh, a, a lot of preoccupation that ends up really affecting your sympathetic nervous system in the long run, your blood pressure uh, as well. So um, let's see if you can uh, figure this one out. We're while performing blood pressure screening at a health fair, the nurse counsels which person is having the greatest risk for developing hypertension. 56-year-old man whose father died at 62 from a stroke, so that's a family history there. A 30-year-old female advertising agent who's unmarried and lives alone. No reason right there. There's nothing that, uh, the, the first one that, that uh, uh, history caught my attention. C is a 68-year-old male who uses herbal remedies to treat his enlarged prostate gland. Unless we knew what herbal remedy it was specifically and whether it does raise or drop the blood pressure, we, that probably is not a good answer because we don't have enough information. And a 43-year-old man who travels extensively with his job and exercises only on weekends. Um, there's no reason he actually exercised, so he has a positive thing. So probably uh, A, um, is, as we talked about in the risk factors, family history is. But again, genetics is now uh, being, to a degree, overruled by epigenetics. And epigenetics really is what turns the genes on or off. And so epigenetic really plays a may much higher role in whether or not a disease condition will happen. Talking about genetics, we have genes that regulate the blood pressure at different times throughout the lifespan uh, and, and again uh, this really down to the cellular level really goes into whether people will be more pro-inflammatory uh, or have uh, the ability for the endothelial cells to activate the vasodilation or not um, and, and uh, create the hypertension uh, overall. Um, so screening is a really important uh, thing to do to make sure that um, we do, if we screen, we can start talking to them early on about healthy lifestyle, which will reduce the risk of them having to get an, uh, on a blood pressure medication if they don't need it. Uh, but if they do, then great. We just want to try to catch them early because a lot of times damages happen before we even know about it. We've talked a little bit, excuse me, I'm going to take a sip here. We've talked a little bit about uh, water and sodium retention through the RAAS uh, system um, and that excessive sodium intake is linked to hypertension. We know that excessive sodium. Well, the most people that consume a high sodium diet, only one in three will develop hypertension. And this is probably due to uh, genetics to a certain degree. Um, but again, I think that even, even, um, even their epigenetics plays a major, major role um, in, in hypertension. The um, link, um, uh, the relationship between salt, blood pressure, and heart changes, this is sort of a chart that goes into uh, what it talks about. So if you are having excess amount of salt, uh, it really ends up having a hypertrophic effect uh, on the heart. And that can lead to the right side uh, as well as the left side, both hypertrophy and ventricular fibrosis. So remember uh, when afterload, which is an increased blood pressure, uh, together with uh, increased uh, intravascular volume, which is a preload. So if your vascular space has more volume, the blood that's going into the heart, to the right side of the heart, 
is going to be higher in terms of volume. And then the blood that's going to be pumped out of the heart, the left side of the heart, is pumping out into the afterload or the, or the resistance area. All of these lead to hypertrophy and fibrosis, mostly the ventricles. And one thing to really understand with ventricular hypertrophy is it's exactly what I was talking about previously about the excuse me, the um, cardiomegaly, when the heart um, is enlarged, um, that it should not, or it should never be considered a, a normal thing, unless you just happen to have a heart size of, of that, that, that size that you've determined you, that you would know that from relatively younger age, especially if you've been going to the hospital to doctors for, for heart conditions that would, that ought to be known at that point. And one thing that I want to bring up into in this slide as well, with that ventricular hypertrophy, when you get uh, a cardiomegaly, we'll, we'll, we're going to see the apex of the heart. The tip of the heart is at the bottom, not the top. And when we go to that fourth to fifth intercostal space to look for that um, point of maximal intensity or the apex of the heart, we want to hear the beat close to the fourth or the fifth. If we hear it in the sixth, then you can assume that uh, there is ventricular hypertrophy or some form of cardiomegaly happening. So assessments are important to help us find these things out. Um, I, I threw this chart in, in here. Uh, so that you could look at the difference between uh, the uh, growing number of cells and, and uh, growing size of the cells. Um, but in this case, really, we're looking at the fibrosis, which is really a lot of extracellular uh, junk is being deposited in the cardiac muscle. Um, and, and, and the thickening of the heart valve starts to happen which leads to that, 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 that fibrosis. And then that basically means that the heart, uh, the muscle is unable to do its job, it's less compliant. And ultimately what we'll see in with the fibrotic type issue, so remember at the cellular level, a cell can be healthy, but as it gets sicker and sicker and sicker, more of the cells are sick. So the whole overall uh, tissue and the muscle is going to be a lot weakened and end up, what we'll end up getting is really a uh, progression to heart failure. Um, we've talked about stress and increased uh, sympathetic nervous system activity, and we know that um, it's long recognized that blood pressure is influenced by factors like anger, fear, pain, and that there are clear physiological responses to stress. Um, some are normally protective to the fight or flight, right, to get out uh, and run. If a tiger is coming, you need to have a sympathetic response, but uh, in chronic sympathetic response should not be happening. Uh, in the old days, they would go out and hunt for a whole month and then rest and eat for the rest of the 11 months. So they had really high stress for a month and then a really chill life in the cave for about 11. Nowadays, you drive down the freeway and we're constantly being stressed. Uh, the driver next to you in the market, somebody got in front of you and uh, exams and you're a, you happen to be a nursing student. And now you have a child and your child is crying. So you see that, that the amount of, of stress that we're put under today uh, um, is, is significantly higher compared to the past, and that means that uh, that we're at higher risk for, for high, high blood pressure um, as well. And we, again, we talked about the altered renin angiotensin aldosterone system, uh, and that increased renin from the kidneys will activate the, the sympathetic system, the RAAS system, leading to blood pressure elevation. And that's, that's the uh, the most uh, important thing because elevated blood pressure uh, would normally want to inhibit the release of that, but that does not occur in patients who have hypertension. That does that that it's released anyways, and um, and and so if they're already hypertensive, it just doubles that hypertension up. Insulin resistance is uh, a, a big topic. Um, I I really have. Uh, I think a lot of the research that I'm looking at is really showing insulin as a pro-inflammatory marker, and yet we continue to give it. In patients like type 1, they don't have an option because they can't produce any insulin. They would die if they didn't. Um, but in patients that are type 2 diabetics, we clearly, clearly want to talk about um, uh, upstream lifestyle modification because uh, uh, it, 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 you want to prevent patients from having to take insulin, from getting their hemoglobin A1C level too high at a 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, where the doctors might at that point 
try to uh, or get the patient onto insulin. And high insulin levels, again, stimulate that sympathetic nervous system and impair nitric oxide. And we know that NO, they, there's quite a few supplements. Um, arginine is one of them that helps the body because we can't really take nitric oxide. It's a gas and it doesn't stay in the system for too long. So we have to take the precursors to help the body. So glutathione is one uh, thing that we can take the precursors to that as well. Um, but a lot of people that take arginine and quite a few of the other uh, precursors to nitric oxide or NO uh, that help with vasodilation, help people, men especially with uh, erectile dysfunction. Um, it also happens to help reduce a lot of that sympathetic uh, activation stress as well and it vasodilates which gives the heart significant amount of rest and bing 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 here we come back right to I mean I always come back to that endothelial dysfunction I think I think that when we treat a patient with lifestyle and nutrients and and so forth what we're treating is a cell right but that cell builds up uh, tissues and the tissues build up an organ and the organ we say gets diseased but ultimately it started with one cell getting diseased that then more cells got diseased and we know that if you have endothelial dysfunction and there's a lot of markers out there that we can check uh, it really puts you at a higher risk for uh, coronary vascular vascular disease um, and so um, keep keep that in mind um, prolonged vasoconstriction really can be caused by high levels of uh, endothelin and vasodil the, the dilation, for example, can be altered by uh, free radicals, basically oxidative stress, the oxygen free radicals, which really, when the body is overloaded with them, end up impairing the bioavailability of nitric oxide. So when you have chronic inflammatory, but especially chronic uh, oxidative stress on the uh, at the cellular level, your body is not able to uh, produce that vasodilating agent nitro nitric oxide and this leads to cellular dysfunction and imbalance uh, of the vasodilation and vasoconstriction mechanism the, the part that it, it decreases the flexibility of your arterial wall which is where the pressure and the tension of blood pressure and hypertension are really working at. So it overstretches it for, for too much, or if it's been overused, it's at this point no longer able to vasodilate or vasoconstrict properly. Um, further pathophysiology um, includes what I've been talking about. So I'm not gonna go over it too much. Oxidative stress, inflammation, autoimmune dysfunction, and uh, reactive oxygen, oxygen and nitrogen species uh, levels will increase in the arteries and kidneys when oxidative defenses are, are decreases, are decreased. So you definitely want to try to re reduce those free radicals with antioxidants and phytonutrients, clearly. And then the inf inflammation, chronic inflammation. Acute is good, chronic is not, um, but when it is chronic, it'll increase the vasculature and kidneys uh, work through basically C-reactive protein, leukocytosis, neutrophils, reduced lymphocytes, and, and that uh, creates the calor, rubor, dolor, and so on and so forth, which ends up uh, causing havoc. And at the bottom, I like to talk, they're talking a little bit about more the immune system and the role it plays with kidneys and the renin system. But uh, I'll, I'll read the quote. If you couple this with genetics, um, the whole problem of the T cell, hepo, hepo cells, and the CD4, which is what we use to look at uh, patients' HIV and AIDS. Uh, but if you couple the, the genetics, epigenetics, environmental genomic interactions that we end up having is an inflammatory fire, the volcano in your arteries and your heart ready to erupt at any time. So we got to go in and send the firefighters in there and medications will help in the acute and critical, but really that inflammatory fire and that volcano in your arteries at the endothelial level, which creates that stretch, which creates the hypertension, which creates the high blood pressure, uh, is really what we need to be working upon. And that's really uh, through lifestyle uh, approaches. Um, we call it the, hype, the silent killer. And some symptoms that we can see of uh, patients who get hypertension is they get fatigued. Dizziness is a really important one to, uh, to keep in mind. And it can be, can be um, uh, pretty, pretty bad. Palpitations, uh, angina, 
uh, as well, and um, dyspnea or shortness of breath with, with walking. That's one of the big things with patients, especially heart failure, is that, hey, I can't walk to that door and back again to my kitchen or back because I, I just, the, it, it's hard to breathe. That is a manifestation clearly of, uh, of blood pressure and heart issues possibly happening. The most common complications of a hypertension are really target organ diseases that happen in the heart, such as a hypertensive, but it could happen in the brain with a, a stroke, ischemic stroke, right? Or, or hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, remember, uh, he ischemic stroke is a clot buildup. That happens at the endothelial cell. Remember when the clots start to build up? If those are released and they travel to your heart, they travel to your brain, you get a heart attack, you get a uh, ischemic stroke. If your blood vessels, that mechanism of vasodilation and vasoconstriction don't work well because it's been chronically overstretched, again, at the endothelial level of the of the, of the blood vessel, um, same thing. What you could end up having is a rupture and now you have a brain bleed and we call that a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, the most common one is, is, is uh, clearly ischemic stroke. I believe it's somewhere around 80%. Um, it, but it affects your eyes, peripheral vascular uh, disease, uh, your kidneys, um, and diabetics can end up uh, going blind. Uh, and a lot of patients who end up having um, and again, this is that one of those, was it the chicken or the egg first? We don't know. Is it hypertension leads to kidney or is it kidney that leads to hypertension? Uh, probably a combination of both. <clears throat> this is the slide that I was referring to earlier. I thought it was behind that, that second one, but it wasn't. This is just to show you. Uh, so what's the difference? What do you see? What do you see on the right side? You see four cells, right? And if you still have four cells, but they grow in, in size, but they're still four, not in number, so the number is still four, they're just larger, we call it hypertrophy. And this again is happening at the, to the heart muscle, it's happening to the blood, the, the blood lining. And the one below, cell hyperplasia, is more of a growth of numbers as opposed to size. And I think this is a really good one to look at because um, hypertrophy is tends to be, I should say, more related to heart problems uh, through the struggle of working against resistance. The heart just, it's just got to compensate. So it grows. Uh, can anybody guess the cell hyperplasia growing in numbers where we might see that? Certain blood conditions and definitely in cancer. Cancer is a growth of an abnormal cell in an area where that's those cell, it could be a normal cell. You, if you have a liver cells, what type of cell would you expect to have in the liver? Liver cells. Well, let's say you have a, a different cell from elsewhere in the body that happens to grow in your liver uh, and it starts to hyperplasia, starts to grow in numbers. That's when we start to uh, say that it's, uh, it's, it's becoming cancerous. And um, we're not talking about cancer, but if you look on the left in the top line where it says basement membrane, once hyperplasia starts to happen and it starts to invade into the basement membrane, we're a step closer to that cancer metastasizing. So it all has to do with uh, cell at the cellular level. And here's, a, here's a, an example of, of that hypertrophy. So not growth in numbers, but growth in size of the cell. And so the top one is looking at a heart that had to go through that compensatory uh, beating hypertrophy of the, of the left ventricle uh, of the muscle constantly pumping against that increased systemic vascular resistance, which is caused by diabetes, which is caused by hypertension, right? And compare the top with the bottom, right? Which is a normal thickness. Just compare the top and the bottom and you'll see how much th thicker how much hypertrophy has has happened and this is an example of cellular adaptation to increase the cardiac workload this that picture there that you're seeing on the top is a heart that probably chronically for quite a while had to work over time to get perfusion to happen we do quite a few diagnostic tests of course we take the blood pressure we can do uh, other diagnostic checkups, uh, uh, and, and, and there's not all of them are routinely done, but we, we, want, we do want to look for causes of secondary hypertension or look for organ disease or overall cardiovascular. So we can do a routine urinalysis. We can check the BUN. 
which is that byproduct, that nitrogen byproduct that talks about the kidneys. We can look at serum creatinine levels for whether or not the kidneys are involved, right? Creatinine clearance is gonna look at the glomerular filtration rate mostly. Um, and de decreases in creatinine clearance will really be, it's when the creatinine clearance is decreased that we'll start to look at uh, renal insufficiency. Um, we may or may not do uh, electrolyte. Electrolytes in the hospital, we will do for sure. Um, and sugar check, we'll look at the, le the levels of sugar. Uh, lipid profiles are generally done outpatient in most uh, primary care providers. Um, and they're getting quite complex nowadays uh, to understand. Mostly ratios is what we want to look at. Uric acid levels can uh, uh, help us determine whether there's also uh, heart problems because the levels will often go, go up if you if your patients are on diuretic therapy and most patients or many patients that have high blood pressure will be on di diuretic therapy. And an ECG is basically necessary as a baseline when they first come in. And that can tell us uh, if they've had a previous heart attack, if they have ischemia going on, if even if they have a hypertrophy as well. Um, and then uh, they'll do further tests if they find that the ECG is done like echocardiogram, uh, uh, angiograms and things of other natures. And then um, let's go to the next. So um, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is uh, when we use, uh, when we check it uh, over a 24 period of hour at preset uh, intervals. Um, the equipment, basically a blood pressure cuff and a in a, in a unit that fits into a pouch and you put on a strap or a soldier, you tell them to hold their arm still by, by their body uh, until ready and then ask them to maintain a diary of the activities that they were doing uh, that may affect the blood pressure. And it's uh, useful for p patients that have elevated blood pressure uh, in a clinical setting um, um, and normal readings when the blood pressure is measured uh, elsewhere. There's a lot of uh, applications for this. I'm not gonna go into any more about that right now. Uh, overall goals really to maintain uh, a goal of blood pressure uh, that's not going to put the patient at risk for uh, uh, organ disease or cardiovascular problems. And again, the lifestyle modifications uh, is, is uh, indicated for all patients, uh, whether they're hyper, pre-hyper, um, second stage, first stage, you name it. Um, uh, Part of those lifestyle modifications is really just we know that overweight, that adipose tissue, uh, increases the risk of hypertension and coronary vascular disease that we know that lowering that or weight reduction can decrease blood pressure in a significant amount of people. Um, and uh, calorie restriction plays a little bit of a, a, a role, but you know, when you do decrease your calorie intake, sodium fat intake are usually also reduced as well. Um, um, and, and uh, it, I, it, there's not really been evidence to show that uh, reducing fat overall um, has dropped, is able to drop the blood pressure. But overall, uh, what we really want to work on is that uh, preventing the atherosclerosis formation to reduce the overall coronary vascular uh, disease risk. And then the DASH diet is really important. Uh, I think of it to a certain degree of as a Mediterranean diet. I mean, it's mostly fruits, vegetables. They still, so from a nursing NCLEX perspective, all will always go with the fat-free or low-fat milk product. Um, from what I think most literature is now saying, especially if you're drinking whole uh, a milk that comes from a trusted source, uh, it's better to get some of that fat. Um, Milk is not necessarily uh, whole milk is not so low fat milk is is in many instances some of the research has, has has pointed to is what I'm trying to say is puts people at more at risk for certain conditions than 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 whole milk. But for NCLEX purposes, always go with the fat free or the low fat milk anytime they ask you that question. And compared with the typical American diet, this DASH diet really eats significantly less meat, uh, eats less. It doesn't add salt to it. The vegetables already are salted and they clearly don't eat as much sweets or added sugars or sugar containing beverages. That's the big problem that most of the standard American diet or the SAD diet. Um, and it has been, we bring this DASH diet up and you may see this again at some other point, exam or NCLEX, but uh, it has been shown to help lower uh, blood pressure and even lower the, the LDL, the lipoprotein cholesterol. 
Um, sodium restriction, well, just try to stay less than two, uh, 2.3 grams, 1.5. Uh, for most America, African Americans and middle aged, uh, um, and 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 alcohol, just moderate moderate drinking of alcohol. Um, in fact, in France and Spain, Italy and Europe, for the most part, people do drink one glass of wine, a red wine of some type, uh, <clears throat> that um, seems to be in some sense for those who have been consuming it for many years. Doesn't mean you have to start now, um, but somewhat cardioprotective. Further lifestyle modifications, we know that uh, a physically active lifestyle is absolutely essential, essential. Um, and you, you, you wanna know that moderate to intense aerobic, at least 30 minutes, most of the days of the week, if it's vigorous, intensive, at least 20 minutes, but three days, and then muscle strengthening at least two times a week or flexibility at least two times a week as well. Um, uh, stay away from uh, tobacco, period won't say more about that and then psychosocial well you know um if you just can't afford the food or you don't have a job and you know you've been laid off and things like that then sometimes um trying to deal with those problems first uh can help a little bit with the lifestyle but that's a little bit trickier um to to manage um but but that said uh we want to emphasize and educate our patients that 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 psychosocial issue is a huge risk factor and that if they allow their outside life circumstances their lack of job or whatnot to lead them to more and more stress on a daily basis ultimately it's going to create a situation where they're going to be worse off than when they first started um, because now not only will they not have a job but they'll be having hypertension and maybe even uh, a stroke or a heart attack and and uh, that's a lot, a lot worse. So this is really from uh, your from uh, pharmacology, and it really right now the available treatments for hypertension really have two actions, two main actions. One, decrease the volume of the blood, the, the blood that circulates through your body. You want to decrease the volume, right? Getting rid of water, and think of what we would do, what we would give for that diuretics, and two we would do, we can reduce the uh, vascular resistance, the systemic vascular resistance by working on the kidneys uh, and the baroreceptors, some neurohormonal calcium channel blockers on the arterial level, quite a few drugs, calcium channel blockers, the direct arterial vasodilators, alpha and beta adrenergic, those all work on the blood vessel directly. The diuretics work most directly onto the kidneys, they decrease they decrease sodium reabsorption, which means that they don't hold water back, which means they end up getting rid of the water. We've got to watch out with that because many of the diuretics, unless it's a potassium sparing diuretic, but most of the di diuretics will decrease potassium when we get rid of that, uh, when we decrease the holding back of sodium. And so we want to always look at their potassium levels before we give them a lot of those um, uh, um, uh, medications. Um, poof. so drug therapy, I'm not going to really go into this right now, so we'll, we'll cover this in our lecture, um, of pharmacology. Um, we do know that the, the one of the JNC, they meet every few years, I forget, it's every four or five years or more, uh, and they come up with, uh, uh, a new, uh, uh, approaches or algorithms, so to say, for drug therapy. And the last one that they had says patients that are above 60, you know, start drug treatment if the blood pressure, it's systolic, that is, is 100 uh, above 150 or diastolic above 90 and try to keep below that. Um, some doctors might even do it uh, uh, closer to 160, depending on the conditions of the patients. But that's what we, this is where we want to learn. And in patients that are below 60, we want to try to keep them below that 140 over, over 90. Uh, and in the, in the really, really elderly, uh, maybe even be less aggressive in drug therapy because it puts them at risk. It's like giving somebody insulin because they have high blood sugars and we end up causing low blood sugars, which are a problem of their own. So we want to watch out and we can assess for that with uh, a dizziness, fatigue, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, in one of the research articles that they did, um, 
the treatment of systolic below 120 rather than 140 <clears throat> did reduce rates of uh, heart or cardiovascular events by almost one third and the risk of death by one fourth. Um, but they, these, these data may, may change as we go down. Here is just a repeat of what resistant hypertension is. And that just means that they're on three drug therapy, including a diuretic or more. Um, and it could be drug induced as well. So they may, you clear, we clearly want to tell them, hey, look, you know, I don't know if your primary doctors told you this, but there is some research out there that suggests that if you are on a antihypertensive of any type, there will be certain nutrients that are going to be depleted. One of them is an enzyme CoQ10. Um, and, and to consume these things is probably not a bad idea, ideally in a whole food form, um, but with supplement if, uh, if, if need be um, as well. Nursing assessment, well, there's subjective, and we want to look at really their past health history, not only their individual personal, do you or have you had a stroke or hypertension or menopause or are you on any uh, hormonal replacement therapy, so on and so forth, but also family history uh, and then drugs as well, right? Are you taking any prescriptions or over-the-counter or illicit drugs or herbal drugs or products? Um, in fact, a lot of the herbal drugs, uh, herbal medications, I think are good. You just have to work with somebody who understands what they're doing uh, before you just start adding things into your system without knowing. That would be just like uh, prescribing an antihypertensive for yourself, no different. Uh, further subjective data that we want to assess is really quite a few things from health perception. What, what, what's health for them, right? What do they think is, is health? Talk about tobacco use, alcohol use, sedentary lifestyle. Uh, we want to talk about nutrition and metabolic issues, right? Like salt, uh, fat intake, weight gain, loss, um, nocturia, elimination, fatigue, dyspnea, um, sexual erectile dysfunction is sometimes a side effect of, in fact, a lot of them, the medications that they're at. And then we also want to talk about uh, with them uh, to assess how they are coping with, with life events, because as we said earlier, they play a major role. Moving away from the subjective, which is what we ask from the patient, now we're looking more at the objective data. Well, clearly we're gonna look at cardiovascular, we're gonna look at GI in the sense of obesity, is their BMI above 30 or not? What's their abnormal waist to hip ratio? And neurological, are they, are they uh, is their mental status changing? Because we know that that can make a big difference because if the heart is not pumping the blood to the brain as it should, or they just went through a coronary artery bypass graft where they fill to the blood out and then back into the patient, how long does that brain go without perfusion? And then it's, it takes a while to get back in and start doing basic calculations. So it's another thing to look at for doing our assessments. Um, nursing diagnosis, there's a lot. Ineffective health management related to lack of knowledge of the underlying problem, the complication that it is a risk, right? And including uh, what are you doing in your day-to-day -day lifestyle? That, that should be, when we talk, it's here when we talk about nursing diagnoses, um, we tend to forget that the nursing model really back from the day of Florence Nightingale was all about uh, lifestyle, sun, light, cleanliness, keep things dry, clean, open, uh, proper nutrition, decrease anxiety, right? Um, but once you're talking about more of the acute care or critical care, then you can talk a little bit more about risk of defer, uh, decreased cardiac perfusion or a risk for ineffective cerebral and renal perfusion. If their high blood pressure is high, they, they're at risk. Whether you like it or not, they're at risk for that stroke. They're at risk for decreased renal perfusion. Uh, they're at risk for, remember, if the heart is beating over time and that hypertrophy is happening, it could be likely that their kidneys won't be perfused. So they're at risk for it, right? Just because they have hypertension, just because they have diabetes. Um, and then potential complications that they may have, obviously, stroke, again, hemorrhagic or ischemic, um, and a myocardial infarction. So what do we want the patient to do? The overall goals, really, we want them, if, if they have hypertension, we're talking about patients with hypertension, uh, pre-hypertension or post stage one, stage two, doesn't matter. We want to achieve and maintain the goal of blood pressure. We want to try to follow a therapeutic plan, including try to keep them to have their appointments with their health care provider. Hopefully, just make sure that they have a health care provider that's going to talk to them about lifestyle. If they have a health care provider that doesn't talk to them about lifestyle, not just nutrition, but what's going on in your life. How are you eating? What are you eating? Are you drinking that alcohol, smoking? Are you drinking soda pop? What, what else is going on? How, how, you, how are you feeling? What's going on in your day-to-day -day life? Talk to me about this stuff. 
those are the uh, healthcare providers you want. And then uh, um, we, we want to try to minimize the side effect of therapy. Really, that's talking about drugs, pharmaceuticals, right? Um, in fact, where did I just read an article that ranitidine was, was producing because of its uh, shelf life, some chemical ADMA or some increase in some, anyways, really bad, really bad. And, um, and then we want to try to manage and cope with what they have. Uh, but really that management and cope should not be, oh, poor you, let me pat you on the back, go home, take this drug, see you later. Manage and cope really means, hey, dude, you got hypertension. We know that there's a lot of things that you can do, but watch out with throwing out a whole bunch of things in your talk on the patient because they may not just give them whatever you know, but then say, start with one thing. I always start with, do you drink sodas? And whether they have aspartame in their diet or they have high fructose corn syrup in their not diet, I always say, start with eliminating that. Then I would say, if you're drinking coffee, do you put sugar in it? Don't put it. Change that for honey, for example. So there are small steps that we can do. And we always want to encourage small steps, not like, well, you better now change because your endothelial cell is screwed and you're, you're, you're going to be screwed if you really don't. No, we talk about small steps, measurable goals, stopping uh, smoking and stop drinking a soda pop are two really big, huge measurable goals that can help the patient decrease their hypertension and thus risk for um, for um, a heart attack uh, or a stroke. And so really, 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 this is the essence of, of, of the nursing model right here, health prevention, right? Like primary prevention, unfortunately, in primary health care, uh, when you go to your doctor, if you have hypertension, they slap that hypertension onto you as a disease and then they give you a drug. But we know, no, no shadow of a doubt, I challenge you all. We know right now, shadow, with no doubt whatsoever, that primary prevention of hypertension through lifestyle modification is the best uh, cost-effective approach rather than treating uh, it after the problem happens. So talk about the diet, talk about phytonutrients. You've had nutrition classes. We won't go over that again. Go back over it and listen to it. Follow the DASH diet. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say reduce sodium, although yeah, you could think about it. The men collects likes to say reduce sodium, but really what you should be thinking clinically when you talk to your patients is don't have excess sodium. Um, and, and this is for everybody, not just people who have um, hypertension. Um, and, it, you know, it's a big thing because um, it, a lot of times we don't catch that people have hypertension until they go, you know, they're a firefighter or they're going to a military physical exam or they're doing their 65-year-old Medicare exam. And uh, we suddenly find out that they have hypertension. And, uh, and unfortunately, the first thing that a lot of doctors tend to do, because many haven't been trained uh, uh, in the lifestyle modification specifically what to do, or they don't have time. They're given seven to 11 minutes for a quick visit. Uh, all they have time is to give you that, that prescription. So make sure you get a, a larger follow-up with the primary doctor that does work with uh, food, nutritional medicine, lifestyle approaches. But uh, get yourself screened if you haven't. Get your patient screened if, you, if they haven't. If they're a diabetic patient, if they are in there for having a, uh, a heart attack, if they're in there for having a stroke and they have no history of blood pressure and they have normal blood pressure, you should still be talking to them about, hey, uh, you know, try to recre reduce the risk for this happening again. Um, this is sort of a side note that I put in. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of evidence online from uh, Lancet studies to, uh, to uh, there's a lot. And basically the, what we're starting to find, especially in the early days, that the effect of a low salt diet um, uh, increases mortality for a lot of patients that have heart failure. Think about that. So we're telling them don't eat salt and there's studies published very pretty pretty hefty um, studies done, and then the Lancet study isn't the only one that really concluded um, that there was not enough evidence to advise that a low salt diet for all of us, though the rest of us, is necessary. But telling people with the congestive heart failure to eat low salt diet is almost criminal, as I'll put in this video for you to see. I'll see if it works. Um, and uh, and so let me let, let's see if this will actually play. Doctor, Doctor, I want to I want talk, talk about, about salt. salt. Uh, a, lot a lot of people have high blood pressure. Just so stay away from salt. But we need it. Well, salt is an essential nutrient. Sodium and chloride. You cannot have nerve impulses without sodium chloride. 
They're an integral part of the biochemical system of nerve transmission. You cannot move water around in your body or retain it in the right compartments inside your blood vessels, inside your tissues, inside the cells. You can't keep things in the right compartment without sodium chloride. The chief cells in your stomach cannot make stomach acid without salt. Okay? Salt is a raw material. Sodium chloride is a raw material to make hydrochloric acid in your stomach. Now, two things have happened because of this terrible criminal advice that doctors have given. It's criminal. Anybody else do this to the American people, they'd be put in jail for life. Some of them would be executed because of the number of people who are killed over this. Right? <clears throat> salt is required to make stomach acid. You don't have enough stomach acid, you get reflux, incorrectly called acid reflux. It's reflux. Mm -hmm. Reflux is caused by insufficient amounts of stomach acid, not too much stomach acid. So doctors have even named it the wrong thing, right? And basically, um, you get reflux when you don't have enough stomach acid to keep your stomach environment sterile. So yeast begin to grow in there, so you eat carbohydrates and sugar. They ferment that, produce gas, uh-oh, heart burn, pressure, reflux. Mm -hmm because you have all these things going in your stomach. Okay, when you get a pH too high, you get a pH above four, all these things. You have a pH under one, your pepsin works to digest proteins, and you can absorb minerals, you can absorb B12. If your pH gets above two, two and a half, you can't do that. Okay, so you're in trouble. I mean, you can take tons of iron supplementation, and if you don't have any stomach acid, you can't absorb iron. Now, here comes the most terrible thing that's happened to America because of this inappropriate advice. Well, there's two things. One, you go back to 1995, <clears throat> 750 people died during a triple digit heat wave in Chicago. It was a two week heat mm -hmm. wave, 1995, I believe it was. 750 people died here in Chicago and thousands of people fell out with heat stroke. The first thing they give them intravenously on the way to the hospital to get heat stroke is saline solution, which is Salt water. Salt water, yeah. And it's absolutely criminal that these 750 people who died were all ones who were on a salt-restricted diet. They're all seniors who were on a salt-restricted diet. They died of heat stroke because of, these doctors didn't have the courtesy to call these people up in good manners just to call up and say, look, whether you believe in the salt-restricted diet or not, right now you need to put a couple of tablespoons of salt in a gallon of water be sipping on that until the heat wave goes away. But they didn't do that. And so all those people who died of heat stroke, who were under the care of doctors, who were on a restricted salt diet, those doctors should be put in jail. Okay? Or almost like the same thing as vehicular homicide, the same type of thing as uh, manslaughter, right? That type of thing. Um, then, here comes the big one. Right now, on the average, from this is a Mayo Clinic study, came out in 2009. They said that as many as 30%, 30 people out of 100 in America now have celiac disease and have trouble absorbing nutrients. And as a result, there's people with 25 legitimately diagnosed diseases, which are all nutritional deficiency diseases. They're going to 18 different specialists for all this. And they're paying you know, tens of thousands of dollars a day to deal with this and simply a gluten intolerance and they can't, their intestines are damaged, they can't absorb nutrients. Well, when you can't digest wheat brought around oat glutens, and you absorb these big chunks of what's called polypeptides, your body recognizes and sets up an intolerance to those partially digested proteins. You get gluten intolerance, you get celiac disease, or bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, diverticulitis, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. And the doctor's approach to these diseases are cut your intestines out. I can't understand how they, you know, you have a malabsorption problem, they want to cut your intestines out. That's really dumb. But at any rate, because they have you on a Salt-restricted diet, you cannot make stomach acid, so your pepsin won't work, and you cannot digest proteins, including the protein of wheat brought around oats. Now, again, there's a big research project come out in 2009 that said, uh-oh, it used to be people who have celiac disease with their kids. kids. And they recognize you can save them from all these terrible diseases, because you can get them off of gluten, and they'd be fine. Well, now people who could eat gluten with impunity. They were really big on eating wheat, brought around oats, no problems. And suddenly now at age 50 or 60, they become gluten intolerant. Well, that's because over the years on a salt restricted diet, they couldn't digest wheat, brought around oat glutens down to their simplest amino acids. Big chunks called polypeptides are being absorbed. 
They set up an intolerance to it, and now in 50, 60, we have 80 out of 100 people with gluten intolerance because of this criminal advice to restrict salt. All right. So that said, I do want to drop a little quick disclaimer here. This guy, his name is Joel Wallach, and he's a naturopathic doctor, also a veterinarian, one of the world's best veterinarian ever to exist on planet Earth. Uh, I challenge you to find somebody who has his history and his background in veterinarian and naturopathic medicine. But he uh, he does uh, run a one of those pyramid scheme companies that sells vitamins and stuff. So I completely sidestep all of that world because I'm not interested in it, and I would suggest you guys do too. And uh, but in terms of him as a scientist and a book that he wrote called uh, by called Epigenetics, probably one of the best health books that I've read. And if you really want to understand who a true scientist is, I mean he's probably one of the world's best histologists as well. And he worked for uh, zoos all throughout the nation from large animals to small animals in all multiple cities throughout the nation also in Africa and so he has uh, a lot of uh, scientific background uh, and research that he's published I've read quite a few of his articles uh, not on the animals but on, on the human uh, and and he's a top-notch scientist and if you ever have a chance and you want to read a really interesting story of his life and who he is and what he's done by the time you finish the book uh, you'll you will be a, a different person all right so let me let's get into uh, I'm not going to go over a few of these other slides you can pause these and look at them this is again looking at some of the studies for the salt I'd gladly give you the references whenever you want um, I did get this straight off of the Institute of Medicine, now called the National uh, Science uh, Academy of, of Science uh, Medicine, and uh, and and um, sodium is. In, they're now saying the American Heart Association is actually. I got this out of a PDF of American Heart Association that sodium is an essential nutrient to controls the blood pressure and is needed to make nerves, and it's just in the right amount. So really, what we're trying to emphasize is not too much sodium. We don't need to add. I'll let you pause this here because these are sort of a side thing that I added for you guys to look at, how we can build our NO, how we vasodilate. You already know the pathophysiology and the underlying uh, reason why a lot of this oxidative stress and the uh, inflammatory response to lifestyles and what we can do about this. So you can pause this uh, at your own uh, will if you wish to learn more and, and uh, read this, feel free to do so. But we're going to go over quickly some nursing implementations. A lot of this I've already other, already covered. Um, and so um, with with ambulatory care, you, you just want to, uh, you know, evaluate uh, their blood pressure, do the assessment, uh, monitor over time and do patient uh, and caregiver teaching. Caregiver is extremely important. We want them to monitor their blood pressure at home. They have to have the proper equipment, make sure they calibrate it every so often. A lot of times they forget to do that um, proper. And then uh, frequency is, uh, you know, do it uh, in the non-dominant arm uh, and usually at the same time uh, every day, um, usually first thing in the morning before you take meds uh, and at nighttime before going to bed is a good way of doing it. But also, you know, I mean, if they're feeling dizzy a lot of the times, I would suggest, hey, take your, just take your blood pressure before you take the medication, you know, because if it's heart rate's below 60 or you're continuing, your blood pressure is continuously low or normal, it could be low or normal because you're on a medication or your lifestyle changes that you're doing are working. Uh, but what you want to make sure is that uh, you're not going to drop yourself too low either. That would be like giving yourself too much insulin. Um, there's a huge em emphasis on why there's a poor adherence to treatment, and all the literature talks about uh, why they're not taking their drugs, right? Lack of trust, lack of confidence, probably not, they don't have money, they can't afford it, uh, low health literacy, um, lack of insurance, high cost, and they just don't, you know, trust with the drugs. So we can give them that conversation about lifestyle modifications. Now, again, if the, we need to make sure that they know what the difference between chronically ill versus acute and, and critical, because if they're acutely ill or critically ill and their blood pressure is really high, they're at risk for bursting a blood vessel in the brain or building more clots and, uh, and, and systemic vascular resistance that's going to increase heart um, uh, contactility and other problems that we've talked about, which are not good in the long run and can end up having a myocardial infarction. So 
we need to talk about that. We need to make sure that they, we have to try to enhance compliance. And pharmacies love, love that we focus on enhancing compliance because where we tend to focus a lot in terms of enhancing compliance is drugs. Are you taking your pill? And a lot of times that's one thing that we want to do because we don't want them to stop taking their pill too fast and too soon. Uh, but if they start implementing lifestyle changes, maybe they can get off the medication. That's for their doctor, for them to work out with the doctor. But we need to have this conversation that it's possible if they make the right thing. So enhancing compliance is not only about the medication, but it's about it, individualizing their care if they have a care provider or a caregiver work with them as well teach them as well the overall expected outcomes the patient we already talked about this achieve the goal so on and so forth um, and uh, this is about um, so what do you think a patient's blood pressure has not responded consistently to prescribed drugs for hypertension the first cause of this lack of response to this nurse to explore is progressive target organ damage that's probably an end the possibility of drug interactions yeah that might be one we want to consider the patient not adhering to therapy now that sounds like like it probably right there and then the patient's possible use of recreational drugs could be could be recreational drugs uh, meth for example tend to uh, create heart problems but they're they tend to be more of the heart failure type with decreasing the ejection fraction uh, rather than than uh, although they can put them as well uh, at risk for myocardial infarction but i would say that in this case patient not adhering to therapy and hopefully when we say therapy, we're talking about they're just not doing that lifestyle. We have to have that conversation. Most of the patients that are lying in that bed in your hospital in front of you haven't had a single person talk to them and say, hey, if you change your diet, lifestyle, stress, so on and so forth, you can change your cellular response to oxidative stress and inflammatory response. Clearly, clearly, clearly. Uh, elderly people, we already talked about it. It increases with age. Um, uh, a systolic hypertension uh, tends to go up with age above 50. Older adults more likely to have white coat hypertension, so have them take it at home if that's the case more frequently and just keep a register and a record of what it is and, and bring it in on the next visit. Um, uh, uh, also, this is for everybody, but older people as well, drug absorption, uh, metabolism and excretion, they can't get it out, the liver's not working, it's overworked, it's uh, over, it's full of toxins already. Uh, they don't have enough sodium, so their pH starts to go up, they can't build that pH, and now they have a uh, pH level of 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, and so obviously no matter what they take, it's not going to work, right, because they can't absorb it, and that, 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 that's a big problem. Often a wide gap between the first cord cough sound and the subsequent beat is, an, is uh, called an oscillatory gap. Um, orthostatic hypotension is a big, huge, huge thing with, um, with elderly people. And the postprandial uh, issue with elderly, with the drops in blood pressure is, is, is huge because the greatest decrease really happens about one hour after eating and then the, the blood pressure will return to preprandial before eating preprandial means before eating levels three to four hours after eating so be careful with giving vasoactive drugs with meals because we are we know that uh, uh, that in elderly a lot of their, their blood pressure may go down an hour after eating food um, we talked about this earlier in the slide what we want and what uh, we, we do have to watch out with NSAIDs because uh, you know they're used with ACE inhibitors and ARBs, they have the potential adverse uh, renal damage and can affect your potassium levels as well. Um, this is a repeat slide from previously, uh, except that now we're looking at high crisis, a hypertensive crisis, and it's a term that we use to really indicate urgency or emergency, and it occurs when your systolic is above 180 or diastolic. Uh, or, and or diastolic are both uh, uh, greater than 110. Sometimes you can find BPs that are 230 over 150 and of that nature. So that's a hypertensive crisis. So if you're an ER nurse, don't pass off giving those hyper antihypertensives to the nurse who's on the floor just because you're busy and uh, make sure you treat that blood pressure and treat it soon uh, um, as well. And that's, that's, that's important. Um, uh, there's a lot of complications that, that happen um, and manifest like hypertensive encephalopathy, which is a syndrome where the sudden rise in the blood pressure, right? Um, 
it will you'll well you'll start to the patient will start to say I have a bad really whopping headache. So watch out with that. It's a big NCLEX one right there. Uh, nausea, vomiting, seizures, confusion, coma, all of that can happen with a hypertensive crisis. Um, renal insufficiency can happen uh, as well because of this. So you got to watch out uh, for this. And the patients will, will try that. The compensatory me mechanism will kick in um, and, and put them really quick at, uh, at risk for, for angina and uh, a lot of other complications uh, as well. So we, we, we have to watch out. And so patient assessment is really important. So IV drug, you really titrate to the map. Uh, we'll talk about that uh, probably in third semester with you guys. we got to monitor the cardiac and the renal function, do our neurological checks to make sure that um, they're getting perfusion not only to the periphery but to the brain too, right? And then we have to figure out what's going on. Is it a primary or secondary? If it's primary, it's idiopathic, a secondary. What else is going on? Are they urinating? What do their liver levels look like? Uh, and then, uh, and then we just need to educate the, the patient to avoid future future crisis. A lot of times, patients that uh, get off of a medication or, or st abruptly stopped it can put them into a hypertensive crisis. So we have to say we have to ask the patient when was the last time you took it. So we're done with the lecture. I'm going to just finish really rapidly with a few slides that I've added on, sort of some clinical pearls that you can look at. This is a repeat of some of the things that we talked about, such as nutrition. We know it's important. DASH diet, we know it's important. Potassium and, and, and re reducing sodium or not adding sodium, I should be saying, can help with the blood pressure. Vitamin C has been shown. Uh, riboflavin, which is B2 as well, can lower the blood pressure. Some studies show garlic uh, can help as well, but garlic is really good for antiviral, if you know what I'm talking about nowadays. It's extremely powerful for that as well. So I'm going to show you some things that I found were absolutely fascinating. And we'll go over this more in the pharmacological uh, uh, lecture that we'll have when you come back from spring break. But there are a lot of natural compounds in food. And thank God for science, because science is now getting to the point where we can understand what's happening with nutraceuticals, vitamins, antioxidants, minerals. They can mimic drugs. Let's say that again. They can mimic drugs. Actually, what I should say is drugs can mimic them, but we like to start with drugs. No, no. We should be starting with the others first. The drugs should be the alternative. You see what I mean? We call the antioxidants and the vitamins and the nutraceutical the alternative. They're not the alternative. The alternative should be the drug. Again, this is for the doctor to say, but it's a conversation that we can have and say, hey, you can take those drugs all day long, but that micronutrient at the cellular level, if you still don't replace it, you're going to have to get a second, a third, a fourth, and then you're going to get persistent hypertension. Your CoQ10 is going to drop and you're going to end up in a, with the heart attack. So let's look at that can mimic drugs, right? And see, see what, that, what that means. So what mechanisms, through what mechanisms can we lower the blood pressure? And this is really, this here, this chart right here is the essence of what your uh, hypertensive pharmacological class should be. We do calcium channel blockers, which are a category of themselves, right? Um, and we know those are drugs to lower blood pressure. And they, what do they do? They slow the movement of calcium into the cell of the heart and, and the blood vessel walls again, right, which makes it easier for the heart to pump and it basically widens the blood vessel. So it, it almost, it's, it's, I don't know if you'd call it a vasodilator, but it works by widening the blood vessel. Uh, and then as a result, the heart really won't have to work against that resistance and ultimately the blood pressure will lower. Beta blockers, right, we know what those are, the beta adrenergic blocking drugs, medications, they reduce your blood pressure basically by blocking the effect of epinephrine that the hormone epinephrine or adrenaline. So beta blockers block adrenaline and adrenaline or epinephrine constrict so you have less constriction. Remember, there's only two mechanisms that we can sort of work on with your medications too, and we'll get to the nutrients in just a second. Diuretics just drop, remove fluid or drop your, and drop your volume, right? Like thiazide can help treat your blood pressure by um, causing the blood vessels to widen and the body to remove extra fluid. ACE inhibitors, Angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or ACE inhibitors, ACE inhibitors, work by relaxing the blood vessel, also decreasing the blood volume a little bit, which ends up lowering your blood pressure and decreasing the oxygen demand from the heart. So that, that helps significantly there. Um, are the ARBs or angiotensin receptor uh, blockers, we'll get to the central alpha agonists in a, in a sl special slide later, but the ARBs uh, have similar effects as the ACE inhibitors. Uh, and then the direct vasodilators 
uh, really just are used to con for uncontrolled hypertensive, to reduce postoperative bleeding, manage acute heart failure, and quite a few other things as well. So with this in mind, right, let's, let's get into that, that who mimics who. Is it the drug that mimics the, what came first? These calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, diuretics, angiotensin, sulfur algebra, diuretics, or the, the, the nutrients that, are, that in many cases uh, nature provides us. Well, let's take a look at calcium channel blockers. We're the world's best calcium channel blocker, by far, bar none, magnesium. So chocolate, dark chocolate, not white chocolate, not Snicker bars, B6, vitamin C, the gamma and the delta versions of the vitamin E, magnesium with low calcium, right, function a little bit as a diuretic, and it assists cysteine, hawthorn, celery, omega, Chinese medicine, they use hawthorn berries for every heart condition, calcium, garlic, taurine, alpha lipoic acid, all work on the mechanism similar or exactly the same as calcium channel blockers. Beta blockers, all the way at the bottom, beta blockers, ha thorn berry. The beta blockers, ha thorn berry. Look at that. So ha thorn berry is working as two medications that your, your doctor might prescribe for you. Diuretics, well, similar ones, B6, especially the P5P, the activated version of it. Taurine, celery, you, know, you get the point. There's significant amount. Look at that magnesium and the coenzyme 10, fiber. And what is the last one on this list? Hawthorne berry. You get the point? Hawthorne berry has already been in, in three of these different medications. Uh, what about the ACE inhibitors? Start with garlic, seaweed, tuna sardines hawthorn berry oh my god that berry whoa boy talk about bonito fish casein whey protein gelatin all of good sources with not with no added uh, processed stuff to it zinc melatonin pomegranate pomegranate is known for helping the heart in many ways as well so these all work in the mechanism that angiotensin converting enzyme is the cell al the central alpha agonists which really reduce the sympathetic nervous system are potassium, zinc. To lower your sodium, increase your potassium, lower your sodium a little bit, or at least don't add it on. Protein, fiber, C, B6, again, CoQ10, celery, gamma linoleic acid, garlic, and taurine all work as to lower your sympathetic nervous system. Uh, uh, oh, that's a repeat there, so let's look at the right side. The ARBs, the Losartan, Valsartan, all the Sartans, uh, again, potassium, taurine, resveratrol, fiber, garlic, vitamin C, P6, CoQ10. So you get the point. These all work on the same systems. And then the final ones are direct vasodilators. Omega-3 fatty acids, especially the EPA and DHA, not only do they thin your blood, but they help dilate your blood vessels mostly. Monounsaturated fatty acids, the omega-9s, although a lot of our American diet, we get a lot of that, we have to watch out. Um, potassium, magnesium, calcium, you can read L-arginine and taurine at the bottom, alpha lipoic acid, vitamin C and vitamin E, uh, all of them uh, in a lot of the phytonutrient uh, that we gave you. And so central alpha agonists in the acute or critical care setting, you're going to see there's clonidine or methyl dopa, and they work by lowering the blood pressure. They reduce hot flashes, relieve withdrawal symptoms, and control impulsive behavior. They're uh, they're, they're used also for opioid dependence, alcohol addiction, menopause, ADHD, spasticity, fibromyalgia. So let's go back. So we're looking, we're talking about, yes, clonidine methyl dopa could be given to all of these, but what side effects will clonidine methyl dopa give you? Well, let's go back to right here on the left, central alpha agonists. These are all things that we could be consuming because we know that they work similar that the clonidine methyl dopa. Actually, it was probably clonidine methyl dopa that, fall, that learned from them. Uh, I'll let you look at this because it's just a repeat of what I've talked about, what, which are diuretics, which are central alpha, which are direct vasodilators, uh, uh, calcium channel blockers and ACE inhibitors. Um, and we're done. This is where we will start with uh, the farm lecture, but that will be from when you guys get back from your um, spring break. So I hope you learned quite a bit. Uh, feel free to pause and go back and uh, review and um, uh, enjoy the rest of your spring break.